it's my great ple pleasure to introduce uh, Rhys Ehrlich to you. Uh, Rhys has been working as a journalist for over 40 years. Uh, and for many years he worked as a staff writer and research editor for Ramparts. Uh, many of you may know that as an investigative uh, reporting magazine published in San Francisco. Uh, today he works as a full-time print and broadcast freelance reporter. Vanishing read, given what's happening to journalism these days. Uh, he reports regularly for National Public Radio, for CBC, for ABC Australia, for Radio Deutsche Welle, and Marketplace Radio. Uh, his articles appear in the San Francisco Chronicle and Global Post, and his television documentaries have aired on PBS stations nationwide. Uh, he's the author, he's a prolific author of a, of a number of uh, books, uh, including a new one that he'll talk about today. Uh, in, in 2003, he co-authored the book with Norman Solomon, Target Iraq, What the News Media Didn't Tell You. Uh, that will be a fairly long book, I imagine. <laughs> uh, in 2007, he published The Iran Agenda, The Real Story of U.S. Policy and the Middle East Crisis. In 2009, he published uh, Dateline Havana, The Real Story of U.S. Policy and the Future of Cuba. Uh, in 2010, he published Conversations with Terrorists, Middle East Leaders on Politics, Violence, and Empire. And his new book is uh, on Syria, which he's going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, Reese has won uh, a number of awards during his, uh, his long career. Uh, in 2002, his radio documentary, The Russia Project, which was hosted by Walter Cronkite, won the In-Depth Reporting Prize for Broadcast Journalism, awarded by the Northern California Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, in 2003, his article on depleted uranium, on the, the American use of depleted uranium ammunition was voted the eighth most censored story uh, in 2003 by Project Censor. Um, in 2004, his radio special, Children of War, Fighting, Dying, Surviving, won a Clarion Award. And in 2006, uh, he shared a Peabody Award um, for the documentary on the history of Asians in the US. Uh, he's won a, a number of awards, and uh, more uh, pertinently from professional associations professional journalism uh, associations. Uh, I think at the present time, where being a reporter in parts of the Middle East makes you a vulnerable target, um, it is more important than ever to recognize the work of people like Reese who are engaging in this in indispensable uh, activity, in indispensable role for a democracy. Uh, to recognize this, actually, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors Declared, uh, I'm not sure many of us will we have, have this happen to us, but then they declared September the 14th to be in San Francisco Reese Ehrlich Day in honor of his investigative journalistic work. Uh, and the resolution read in part, quote, uh, investigative reporters are under attack in the US and around the world. Mr. Ehrlich exhibits the finest qualities of such reporters, willing to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, Reese has just returned from, uh, from northern Iraq, um, and I heard him speak yesterday uh, around this topic, and uh, I think for a lot of us um, who, who thought we had very some kind of clear notions of what was going on, in that the last few months uh, have been challenging, because it's been, you know, it's, it's a very confusing situation. Uh, and I think um, Reese will help us cut through that confusion to tell us, uh, to, to, to let us know what's really at stake. Uh, so please welcome Reese. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I don't do a traditional book reading. I don't quote from my own book. Uh, I just tell you about some of my experiences and make reference to the book Inside Syria and hope you go outside and buy a bunch. <laughs> Perhaps the best way to understand what's going on in Syria today is to visit with me some of the cities that I have visited in the last couple of years. 
The story begins in Fishkapur in northern Iraq in the Kurdish region. It's a small town that probably most Iraqis have never even heard of. And it's where the Yazidis and the Christians and other minorities fled after being attacked by the Islamic State. And as you may recall, in July, the Islamic State attacked the city of Mosul. The Iraqi army took off their uniforms and fled. This is a US trained army that was supposed to have been ready to take over uh, governing and protecting the country. Uh, they fled. The Islamic State expanded and uh, took over nearby towns and villages, and people fled. And what they did was horrific, was criminal, was uh, at the level of war crimes, but it was perfectly rational from their standpoint. These are not crazy people. These are not um, psychopaths. They have a very clear political agenda, and that is to take over political and economic power in parts of Syria and, and in Iraq, to use Islam as the excuse, because what they're doing has absolutely nothing to do with the real religion of Islam. And they know that they can't do that as long as there are certain minorities living in the areas that they want to control. So what they do is they kill some and terrorize the rest to flee. And that's what we saw. It's a kind of ethnic cleansing. Other groups have used it in other times and other places. And it's perfectly rational if what you want to do is impose your dictatorship on an unwilling people. The, we go next to the city of Erbil, which is the capital of the Kurdish region of Iraq, where the, I met with US diplomats, with uh, Peshmerga leaders, that is, leaders of the fighting force, the military in Kurdistan, and with leaders of the Kurdish government and, and political parties. And what became clear was that the US had uh, started bombing just a matter of a few days before I had gotten there. Uh, and it put forward three reasons at the time. One was to protect the Yazidis and other minorities. Two was to protect US military personnel who were stationed in Erbil. And three was to protect Kurdistan from being overrun by the Islamic State. And in my interviews and investigations and firsthand uh, reports, I was able to figure out fairly quickly that actually none of those reasons made any sense for what the US was doing. Why? Because the Yazidis and the Christians and the other minorities were certainly faced horrific uh, conditions initially. But very quickly, the crisis ebbed. And as the crisis ebbed, the US actually stepped up the bombing. So it wasn't really a humanitarian effort that was the motivation. Secondly, the question of the US personnel, military personnel, look, the airports were open. If they wanted to evacuate them, they could have done it in less than 24 hours. So there was no real danger to the US military personnel. And the third reason was there was zero, less than zero chance that the Islamic State would overrun Kurdistan. Why? For the same reasons I explained before. They can't govern an area in which nobody in the country wants them to govern. And that was the case for the Kurdish region. The Kurds hate the Islamic State. Ethnically, politically, religiously, pretty much any way you want to look at it, there's no way they would submit to the Islamic State rule. So, and the Islamic State knows that. So what they did was they came up and took over some territory between their area and where the Kurds are, but they didn't go into, this, into the Kurdish region. And they could have possibly fired artillery or mortars. It could have caused some damage and some problems and destabilized the region, that's for sure. But there was zero chance that they were going to take over. So if those official reasons were not the reasons for the latest war, and make no mistake about it, it is a war. The United States claims it's a counterinsurgency action. You know, when we send in people to act as spotters on the ground, and we now have helicopter pilots, and we now have 3,000 advisors, and they've just added 1,500, or announced that they're gonna add 1,500 more. That's a war, folks. It's a war. If Putin did that in the Ukraine, would we agree, oh, no, those are simply Russian advisors helping the local rebels in Donetsk or somewhere like that? No, of course. What Putin is doing is a war, and what we're doing is a war. So what are the real reasons? 
And in order to understand that, you have to go with me to the city of Kirkuk, which is another city in northern Iraq. It was nominally controlled by Baghdad until about June, early July of this year, when it was taken over by the Peshmerga of the Kurdish region. And it's also the oldest Arab city producing oil in the, in the, in the world. Uh, in 1927, the British discovered oil there. Uh, they, of course, were the victors of the World War I. They knew there was oil somewhere in the region, and they had been exploring for it. And the, at the, when they hit the oil, they formed a company with British, French, and American oil companies. Sure coincidence, right? The folks who won the war managed to have the exclusive contracts for developing the war. And since 1927 onwards, foreign oil companies have dominated Kirkuk, much to the anger of local residents. And how did I know this? Well, I hired a local fixer. Fixer is journalistic lingo for somebody who arranges interviews and maybe translates. And this is a magazine photographer who took me out in his car out to the oil fields. I asked to see what there are in the oil fields in Kirkuk. And we're driving out there. It's starting, night is starting to fall. It's dusk. And suddenly there's this enormous flame. It's the biggest flame I've seen in my entire life, the open flame. And what it is, it's the natural gas burning off the oil wells. That is, when you pump oil, natural gas is also released. And normally you cap it and you use the gas for energy. It's also extremely environmentally damaging to just burn and throw all these particulates in there. Most countries ban flaring, is what it's called. But Baghdad and the British and later American oil companies never got around to uh, banning that. So the, there's this enormous flame. In fact, it's known, it's, well, it's considered a landmark in Kirkuk. If you want to find out where the oil fields are, just go and look for the flame, and there it is. And as we're, he's explaining this background history, my fixer starts singing. He just breaks out in song. And this is something young Kurdish men like to do, apparently. And I've, been, <laughs> I've been in uh, Kurdish regions of all four countries where the Kurds live, and they're very proud and uh, cultured people, and they like to sing, and they have their particular dances, and strong cultural identification. So I asked him, well, what is this song about that you're singing? He says, it's a lament for the people of Kirkuk and the fact that we've been cursed by oil. <laughs> and one of the lyrics actually talks about maybe we'd better off, be better off if they had never found the oil in the first place. That's how bad the oppression of the oil companies and the pro-oil company governments have been over the years, that they write songs about it. And my other fixer who had come with me from Erbil started joining in to sing, because he knew the lyrics too. It was that well known of a song. And it wasn't something that was written yesterday, but it was, um, I guess, a standard ditty uh, for the Kurdish lament of, of oil. And it does tell you one of the real reasons that the US is involved in, uh, in Iraq and Syria right now. And that's oil. Iraqi, uh, Iraq itself is has they estimated the third largest reserves of oil in the world. The Kurdish region by itself has the ninth largest, if you believe the statistics from the Kurdish government. And who controls the oil of the region has a big impact on who controls the oil of the world. And that's what the game is about. It's not about just supplying oil for the United States. Because after all, the United States now is producing, producing a lot of oil domestically. Uh, through shale oil and other means. But that doesn't really matter. What you need to do is control the oil supplies of the world and deny them to your enemy. So the US objective is to long term have strategic control of oil supplies and make sure that China and Iran and Russia and other whatever the enemy du jour might be doesn't have access. So that's the 2003 Iraq war. By the way, we're now involved in our third war in Iraq. Think about it. In the 2003 war, one of the objectives was to privatize the Iraqi oil industry, give it to US, British, and other allied oil companies to produce new wells and drill the old oil, and keep other uh, oil companies from the so-called enemy nations away from the oil. Now, it didn't work. They were unable to do it, and it's one of the signs of the defeat of the United States in that 2003 Iraq war. 
Now, I don't know if this comes as a surprise to you, but the U.S. lost the war in Iraq. Well, how can that be? <laughs> how can that be? The U.S. doesn't lose wars. So therefore, we couldn't have lost in Iraq, right? But take a look at it. We, 2008, the Bush administration, not Obama, the Bush administration signed an agreement with the Iraqi government to pull out all the troops, to close all the military bases. And then when the Iraqis insisted that we live up to the treaty that we, or the agreement that we had signed, people were outraged and said that Obama didn't argue hard enough to keep the troops there. Horse bucky. The U.S. having to pull its troops out, so you have three things. The U.S. had to pull its troops out, it had to close all its military bases, and the government that resulted was more favorable to Iran than to the United States. That's a pretty good definition of defeat. But of course, neither high-level Democrats nor Republicans want to admit that, and they end up blaming each other for what uh, had been a disaster from the beginning. So the issues that are really at stake here are oil, reestablishing military bases, that's one of the most <coughs> goals. We're already you know, having to uh, find a place for all these new advisors to stay. So those temporary military bases, the US hopes will become permanent. I think the Kurdish leadership would welcome establishment of US military bases in Kurdistan, if the US chose to do so. And ultimately, the US, another US goal is to have, is geopolitical, that is to have a pro-US government in power in Baghdad and in Damascus, uh, if that were possible. And the way Syria fits into all of this, Syria doesn't have large oil. It has some oil, but it's relatively small on an international scale. But what it does, what it does have is what every real estate agent covets. Location, location, location. It borders Israel and Lebanon and Turkey and Iraq. It's a transshipment point for arms and supplies to Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. It plays a key role because of its geographic location. And the US wants to get rid of Assad, who has been a opponent of the side for some years, and establish a pro-US regime in Damascus. There's only one problem. The people of the region aren't interested in that happening. And the US is running smack dab into the fact that whatever it tries, whatever groups it tries to form, can't get a popular base because US policies are so unpopular in the region. It's not because Obama has been weak-kneed or vacillating or didn't know what to do or didn't arm the moderate rebels enough or arm them soon enough. By the way, the term moderate rebel means pro-US rebel, right? So if you think about the term moderate and substitute the term pro-US, it makes a whole lot more sense. So the, there was an opinion poll that was just done, I just read it uh, in the last day or two, of 5,100 uh, residents of Arab countries, of about eight countries around the Middle East, including Palestinians and Syrian refugees and Iraqis and people from other neighboring countries. 80% of them opposed the policies of the Islamic State. 80%. So, and this is Sunnis and Shia, Kurds, and everybody. 72% opposed the policies of the United States. Think about that. So they oppose both ISIS, or ISIL, or Islamic State, and the US policy. The choice is not between the Islamic State taking over the region and the US is the only power that can stop it. The choice is between what the people of the region can do to stop ISIS whilst continuing to oppose US intervention. To understand more about that and the coalition that the US formed, I'm going to take you to another city in a moment. But as you know, when the US started this latest war, it claimed the support of 40 countries around the world. It never quite got around to naming which 40 <laughs> and what they were going to do. But we, you always have to have a coalition when you start a war, in, if you're the US. And so Vietnam was a coalition, because Australia and South Korea and the Philippines were initially involved. But we know, on the record, that the Vietnam War was a US war. And the, remember the coalition of the willing in 2003 the definition of the new title that came up because we couldn't find anybody to support us. So we had to go to second and third tier countries who really didn't do all that much, but we called it the coalition of the willing. So they're, they're doing it all over there. And yes, there are a few countries that are dropping bombs, but the, virtually the entire military effort 
in the air is conducted by the United States. And absolutely none of the coalition members are willing to send their troops in to fight. And the contradiction is the US says, acknowledges, that it cannot win the war through bombing alone. Somebody has to go into the cities like Mosul, take them over, defeat the enemy, and then hold them and govern them. And the problem is there's nobody who can do that. There's nobody in Arab Iraq, and there's nobody in Syria. And that's the core of the US problem. And to understand this problem in the coalition, I'm going to take you to the city of Suleimania. Suleimania is the second largest city in Kurdistan. It's, uh, and I had visited there on a previous trip, and I stayed in an old Saddam Hussein era hotel that was concrete blocks covered up with concrete painted gray. I mean, this was a one-star hotel where one of the stars had fallen off. I mean, this <laughs> was, the beds were made out of sewer. You know, and we were, we're talking difficult times here. Uh, but what made the place really interesting was that downstairs there was a, a tea house, and every morning, Journalists and diplomats and spies all gathered together from different parts of the world. So there were Canadians and Brits and Iraqis and Kurds, and Turks, and it was like out of a, some novel about World War I, and the only thing missing were the pheasants, right? <laughs> so I wanted to take advantage of this and set up some interviews, try and meet some new sources. So first, however, I had to learn how to drink the tea, because in that part of the world, the tea is served in a glass cup that's perhaps this tall with an indentation. No cup holder and no handle. It's just the glass. And you make the tea by putting three teaspoonsfuls of sugar or more in the bottom of the tea cup, the glass. Strong black tea leaves and then boiling hot water. And then you take a little spoon and you stir it up. So how do you drink this thing, right? And I see some, some of you in the audience may have been from the area. They may know what I'm talking about. See the smiles. Uh, what you do if you try to pick it up by the top lip, and the steam comes up and burns the palm of your hand, so that's not good. And you try and come, hold it horizontally by the lip, then it burn, burns your fingers. That's not good. So I didn't know how to drink this tea, but I'm the ever intrepid investigative reporter, <laughs> having traveled the world. I decided to look around the room and see how everybody else was doing. <laughs> and what they did, the most popular method, besides just letting it cool off, was to pour it into a saucer and let it cool and then slurp it as you look to see who's spying on you from the left and then look to the right and see who's spying on you on the right. <laughs> and that's how I made the eye contact and set up my interviews <laughs> and enjoyed my tea. Now, Mania and subsequently in other parts of Iraq and Syria, was that everybody has their plan for what they'd like to see happen in the region. And everybody has their plan for what they want the United States to do that will help them with their vision. And none of it has anything to do with what benefits the people of the United States. And the thing to keep in mind is that currently the Islamic State is an evil, war criminal, human rights violating group that is certainly a danger to the people of Syria and Iraq, but it is of no more danger to the people of the United States than the Al-Qaeda similar isolated terrorist groups. In other words, they don't have sleeper cells, they don't have secret agents, they don't have people of some kind of chain of command to order attacks on the United States. At most, you see isolated individuals who've been radicalized by reading something on the ground. And, and that's hor horrible enough. Those are crimes, in, in some cases, of what they do. But that has nothing to do with you know, directions coming from uh, the Islamic State in the region. And that's a critical distinction we have to make, which is that there's lots of incredibly awful human rights violations and attacks and terrorism going on around the world. And the United States cannot and should not be involved in trying to stop all of them. The question is, is it really a threat to the United States? And the answer is no. It's not any more threat than other previous uh, uh, terrorist groups. So in order to understand the people that I talked to in Suleimania and this coalition issue, it's important to understand what each of these countries, what their goal is, what they'd like to see the US do. So let's take the example of the Kurds. 
The Kurds are probably the strongest allies in the United States and the region. We hear a lot about the Peshmerga fighting and they're, uh, have they had some victories uh, recently in fighting against the Islamic State. But the Kurds, and particularly the top leadership of the Kurdish regional government, have their own agenda, which is for, to form an independent uh, uh, Kurdistan in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. So I mentioned before that the Islamic State had attacked in June and July. When the Iraqi army threw down its weapons and took off its uniforms, the Islamic State seized American military tanks, and machine guns, and other artillery pieces. I'm sure you heard about that. But so did the Kurdish leadership. So did the Peshmerga. They also took, managed to arm themselves. And they also expanded their territory by 40%. They took over the city of Kirkuk, which had been a disputed ter uh, city for many, for many decades. And um, they simply came in and took it over. And de facto, they said, they're not going to let it go. What I reported on, and it has not been reported elsewhere, or certainly not very widely, is that the Kurds, the KDP, or the Kurdish Democratic Party, the leading party in Kurdistan, made a deal with the Sunni Arab tribal chiefs who were aligned with this Islamic State, not with the Islamic State itself, but with their allies, to have a non-aggression pact. So that from late June until August, the Kurds agreed not to attack the Islamic State, and the Islamic State agreed not to attack the Kurds. Then the Islamic State reneged on the deal and attacked the Kurds, particularly in the areas that 40% of the territory that I just talked about that they had expanded into. They went and tried to take that back or take it over for themselves. So the famous Parish Murga, which is supposed to be this fierce fighting force, was caught off guard and had to retreat. And that was one of the, the fact that there was a political betrayal and that they were caught unawares politically accounts for why some of the defeats took place. So to this day, in the interviews I did, the KDP leadership wants to hold a referendum for independence in Kurdistan. Not all the Kurdish regions, but in the Kurdish region of Iran. And if they held a referendum, for sure the people of Kurdistan would vote for independence. So what we have is this situation, as I said before, everybody has their own agenda and they want the US to follow through on it and to agree with it. So in the case of the Kurds, they are certainly willing to fight the Islamic State today, but ultimately what happens in that part of Iraq is not a great concern to them, only insofar as it might be a threat to them. So if the Islamic State took over in the middle part of Iraq, just for example, and didn't attack Kurdistan, wasn't threatening Kurdistan, they could live with that as they did for the couple months. And in fact, what is likely to happen right now, the United States, France, Britain, Germany are all arming the Kurds as a way to fight the Islamic State. But those arms will be used tomorrow to fight the Iraqi army when the Kurds declare their independence. So um, the Kurds have certainly a legitimate right to self-determination. I've met with Kurdish groups and leaders in all four countries where they live, in Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. They've suffered humiliation and discrimination in all the countries they've been in, and they have a right to self-determination. But when, under what circumstances, and what kind of government they have is very much up for debate among the Kurds themselves. The other country directly involved in this so-called coalition is Turkey. The US proclaims that Turkey is part of the coalition. But in fact, they're extremely reluctant, and they have their own agenda and their own differences with the United States. And it comes up in two ways. Turkey has its own issues with particular Kurdish groups. The PKK, or the Kurdistan Workers' Party, is a group that's been fighting an armed struggle inside Turkey for th roughly 30 plus years, in which they're seeking greater autonomy for Kurds within Turkey. They're strongly opposed by the, Kur the Turkish government who considers them separatists and terrorists. The United States labels them terrorists. But there's a little bit of a problem. The group PKK has an affiliate in Syria. And you know this city of Kobani? You probably all heard about it. The city that, uh, near the Turkish border that's being fiercely contended and the Islamic State is attacking and it's being defended by Kurds. 
the folks who are defending Kobani are affiliated with the PKK. And the U.S. is now dropping arms and ammunition to them. So the U.S. is arming a group that it considers terrorists. You see how complicated this stuff gets, right? Um, the other issue that the Turks have a problem with, and it goes well beyond the Turks, is that they don't understand this new pivot to make the Islamic State the main enemy, not Assad. They still see Assad as the major enemy. And it kind of makes sense if you're in the power extension business, uh, trying to extend your influence. It was only a little more than a year ago the United States was ready to bomb Assad for his supposed use of chemical weapons, remember? Mm -hmm. Now we're bombing the people opposed to Assad. And Assad is going, yay, <laughs> I'm very happy. He doesn't express it quite that way. Uh, but why? Because he's now able to bomb other rebel groups. The United States is taking care of the worst rebel group. And he's able to bomb the others, and he's very happy with it. So the Turks don't understand this. And they consider the Islamic State certainly to be evil, but they don't uh, uh, agree with the current pivot. And ironically enough, neither do a lot of the Syrian rebel groups, including the ones the US has been backing and promoting for all these many years. So I'm sure all of you have heard of the Free Syrian Army, right? It was the moderate rebel group, the group that was going to, that truly represented the people of Syria. Uh, along with a civilian coalition that the U.S. cobbled together. It didn't work, they tried a second coalition. And by the way, they tried to reform the Free Syrian Army as well. But now, apparently, they've given up entirely because as of a couple of weeks ago, the Pentagon announced they're no longer going to fund the Free Syrian Army. Why? Because the Free Syrian Army doesn't agree with this new pivot to attack the Islamic State as the main enemy. They still see Assad they as the main enemy. And they certainly oppose the Islamic State, but they want to chain their fire and alliances align with other rebel groups willing to fight Assad. So the U.S. has got to cut loose the one group, the one military group that it claimed was uh, representing moderate, i.e. pro-U.S. interests. And that then takes us to Saudi Arabia. Because the latest plan, and please keep a straight face when I describe this, the latest U.S. plan is to train moderate rebels in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Now, that, that, you know, that's true. <laughs> uh, and it goes something like this. The uh, US CIA and military will vet rebels inside Syria, send them out to uh, Saudi Arabia, where they will be trained by the Saudi military and presumably intelligence services, to then come back into Syria as a moderate rebel force the US can rely on. Even on its face, it's absurd, because that, that process would take at least a year and they haven't even started. So what exactly is supposed to happen in the year that the US is bombing in Syria, waiting for this uh, moderate force to be created? But it's even worse than that. <laughs> this, <laughs> I know, how can it be worse than that? All right. uh, Saudi, the Saudis, in reporting I did for Global Post, I showed that the Saudi government and wealthy Saudi individuals were supporting the Al-Nusra Front, which is the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. And it's the group from which the Islamic State split off. And at the time I was writing, they were all one organization. And what the Saudis did, because they have a lot more religious and political affiliation with these extremist groups than they have with the more conservative Islamic parties uh, in Syria. And uh, they were uh, helping the Al-Nusra Front while denying it all along. So why are they going to do anything different with these so-called moderates? that are going to be sent to them, if they ever are. And so sending moderate rebels to Saudi Arabia is like sending Chicago police cadets to be trained by Al Capone. <laughs> it ain't going to work, folks. So I want to take us next to the uh, city of Jerusalem and up to the Golan Heights in Israel. A year ago, I traveled to Jerusalem to research the book. And a little detail that's often forgotten in the discussion of Syria, which I talk about in my book in a chapter on Israel and Syria, is the fact that in 1967, Israel seized the Golan Heights from Syria and annexed it some years later. And every Syrian I've ever met, of whatever political stripe, whatever religion or ethnic group, believes that this 
Golanites are Syrian territory and they should be returned. As do this, the 20,000 or so mostly Druze people of Syrian origin and their children who currently live in what is now Israel, but used to be part of Syria. And so I wanted to understand more about this and Israel's role in this war. And so we drove up from Jerusalem to the Golan Heights. I, we got there kind of mid-afternoon, so by the time we finished some of the interviews, the dusk had fallen, it was nighttime. And my fixer, who was a local Druze reporter, said, I want to show you something. But he didn't tell me what. Okay. So we drive out on a, dirt, uh, a regular highway, <coughs> we get off onto a gravel road, then we get off the gravel road onto the dirt road, and it's dark, and there's no lights, and I'm in the middle of uh, the Golan Heights. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't really know this guy. <laughs> and, uh, this is some pretty dicey territory here, and uh, I don't think anything's going to happen. And, uh, I'm not quite sure. And he wouldn't tell me where we're going. So finally, we came to a big boulder, and we stopped. That was it. That was the end of Israel. And what he had taken me to see was at night, it was a, a, a high spot. And we were looking down on the no man's land between the two countries, and then you could see Syria, clearly. And there was, uh, you could hear machine guns and artillery fire going on. And there were three different places where the fighting was going on on the Syrian side. One, and he explained to me, one was the Free Syrian Army, one was the Al-Nusra Front, the Al-Qaeda affiliate, and one was the Syrian Army. And as he's explained in this to me, suddenly we see some headlights from what looks like a car driving out into the no man's land. I said, who is Meshuggah enough to go out and attack, you know, drive out in the middle of the no man's land? And who's, that's Yiddish for who's crazy enough to go out in the middle of the no man's land uh, at night, no less. He says, don't worry, it's an Israeli ambulance. Huh? Well, it turns out the Israelis will treat civilians who have been injured in the fighting or for whatever reason. If their injuries are serious enough, they'll put them in an ambulance, take them to an Israeli hospital, fix them up, and then take them back to Syria. So it's publicized in Israel as a humanitarian effort, which it is. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, because you have three different forces fighting over it, and Israel has absolutely no interest in treating fighters or civilians who support the Syrian army, nor the al-Nusra front. The people they're interested in is helping is the uh, free Syrian army. So they have intelligence agents on the ground who help vet the wounded and figure out who it is that is politically okay to uh, uh, treat. And those are the people who make it out to the no man's land and who get, get sent out for treatment, including young men of military age, so long as they don't have weapons on them at the time. And then they can claim their civilians. So Israel is, in fact, supporting the Free Syrian Army. And that's not the only thing. I, some of my research shows that they have intelligence agents in Jordan, or the CIA and the, uh, uh, the Jordanian intelligence agencies are training uh, uh, rebels in Jordan. Uh, they have not played the role that Assad claims. Assad, from day one of the uprising in March of 2011, claimed the US, Israel, and Saudi Arabia was arming and leading the demonstrations against his otherwise pure uh, and good regime. Uh, that was clearly bogus. Uh, but uh, Israel has uh, definitely, at this point, decided that Assad should go and are supporting the opposition. Um, for our final city on this tour, I'm going to go to another city known for its diplomats and spies, Washington, D.C. And in Washington, I got lost on my way to the State Department. Now, this is not easy. If any of you know Washington, the State Department takes up an entire block. I mean, it's one of the biggest buildings in the city. And there's a subway stop named after the Foggy Bottom. And what had happened is that I had been asked by a State Department analyst uh, dealing with Syria to come speak to a group of Syrian analysts in the State Department. And I said, look, it's not going to work. Um, that my views are too far outside the mainstream. Uh, it's not going to do any good. She says, no, no, no. They really have to hear what you have to say. I want you to 
So I agreed if I got an interview from them for my book, I would go and talk to their people. So we did. And it turns out when I went to the State Department main lobby, they never heard of her. Excuse me, because she worked in an annex across the street down the block, and we finally got it all straightened out. So I got them lost. Luckily, most people on the street spoke English, and I was able to find out where I was and where to go. Uh, so when I spoke to this group, you know, sometimes you hear the argument that the State Department or other U.S. officials are unaware of conditions, they're unfamiliar with conditions, uh, and they they perhaps don't speak the languages, and the, this ignorance is what leads to bad policy decisions by the United States. I don't think that's the case. My experience is that the State Department and other US government officials concerned with a particular country are actually quite knowledgeable. In the case of these Syrian analysts, I could mention obscure rebel groups, and they know immediately who I was going to talk to. Uh, some of them spoke Arabic. Some of them had lived in Syria prior to the uprising. So these are a very, they're the most knowledgeable people of, among Americans that I've ever met. The problem isn't the lack of knowledge. The problem is bad policy. And what happens is that as the policy recommendations, whether it's from the low levels of the State Department or the Pentagon or the CIA, as the recommendations get passed up the line, the reality on the ground is lost in favor of the reality of Washington. So everything is seen between the prism of high-level Democrats, high-level Republicans, high-level think tank people, military people in the Pentagon. And that, most of the time, if not all the time, has nothing to do with the reality on the ground. So what does that mean for Syria? In the case of Syria, there's two choices in Washington. One is traditional, classical American military intervention the kind of stuff that the neocons did under Bush, the current hawks like John McCain, the senator who's never seen a country he wouldn't invade, uh, Lindsey Graham, but also Hillary Clinton, Petraeus, other supposed moderates or liberal people. There are hawks who want to see, in, in this context, not only more arms to rebel groups, but boots on the ground, more American combat troops, if they were, when and if necessary, and they are going to be necessary. The, uh, the other poll is the humanitarian interventions. And these are the folks in the main uh, part of the Obama administration, in which they say, well, no, 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 we don't intervene for strategic oil or military bases or anything of these kinds. Although, of course, if we benefit from that by our intervention, well, that's nice collateral advantages, so to speak. No, we intervene because of humanitarian concerns. So we intervene to stop the slaughter of the Yazidis. Remember Rwanda. We can never allow that to happen again. They've got a whole set of uh, arguments that go with that. But you know, if you're a Syrian or an Iraqi who's on the receiving end of a US missile, it really doesn't matter whether it was done by a classical interventionist or a humanitarian intervention. You're still just as dead. And the, the idea that maybe the US shouldn't intervene at all is not even considered. So when I made my presentation at the State Department, I said, look, the U.S. has no business intervening. At that point, we hadn't started bombing yet. But I said, we shouldn't be sending arms to try and create a rebel group that's pro-U.S. It makes no sense. We should be actually working with Turkey and Saudi Arabia to stop their interventions. And on that basis, we can go to Iran and Russia and Hezbollah and say, look, we've stopped or we've reduced our intervention. You should do the same. And let, let's work together to allow the people of Syria to decide what they want, what kind of government they want, and have a political solution. Well, they looked at me like I just landed from Mars. I mean, the non-intervention position is not considered as even a, a, an option to be discussed. And the argument is, well, if we are superpower. If we don't intervene, somebody else will. There's a vacuum. The idea that the people themselves can resolve this is not even considered. And I decided, decided to them, I said, well, look, we all now know what a disaster the 2003 Iraq war was, right? The invasion and occupation. It was an economic disaster, a political and military disaster. As noted previously, we lost the war. What if the US had never invaded Iraq? 
2,000 year old dragon. Oh, Saddam Hussein is so powerful. His people are so crushed, they'll never be able to do anything. Well, what do you think would have happened in 2011 when the Arab Springs broke out all over the region? You don't think the people of Iraq would have risen up as well? So it's a question of timing and faith in the people and not asserting uh, US uh, so-called national interests. So about this point of my talk, and I've given this talk now at various universities and groups, church groups and others around the country, uh, people are thinking to themselves, well, you made some interesting points, please, but I'm really depressed. <laughs> every, every time I open the paper, there's some new extremist group, some new crisis, and then the Ebola thing hit, oh boy. Well, I'm actually optimistic in the medium and the long run, and I'll explain why. In the short run, I think there's going to be a lot of problems. This latest escalation, and it will continue to escalate, is a disaster. It's a disaster for the people of the United States. It's a disaster for the people of Syria and the people of Iraq. The war is now, according to the Obama administration, going to cost $5 billion for, year, for the first year. And that's a lowball figure, because that doesn't factor in eventual benefit, veterans benefits and medical care for our soldiers, et cetera. It doesn't factor in that the war is going to have to escalate, and they're going to send in more combat troops more uh, armaments, more military personnel. So you wait and see. We're looking at double-digit billions expenditure that they'll acknowledge. And simply, this country cannot afford another useless, wasteful war. You know, when cities or states go to the federal government and they say, you know, we need money for education or health care or infrastructure, there's no money. Why? Because you have to be fiscally strict. You have to balance your budget. You can't go wasteful, you know, engage in all this wasteful spending. But when it comes to a useless war, there's unlimited funds available. And where does it come from? The same place that it comes, doesn't come from for the civilian spending. And of course, it's going to lead potentially to another economic crisis like we had in 2007-2008, which was spurred in part because of this deficit spending for so I'm not predicting there will be an economic crisis in the next few months or anything like that, but we're laying the groundwork for yet more economic disaster. In the medium run and the long run, however, I'm actually pretty confident and pretty optimistic. Why? Because the Islamic State has a serious internal contradiction. First of all, it's not a unified top-down group. It's got lots of factions and groups within it, and, and localities govern areas in their own way, different necessarily from the one next door. More importantly, their rule is so harsh that it alienates the Sunni Muslims that they claim to be representing and benefiting. And there's already been rebellions by Sunni tribes in uh, Syria. They've been brutally repressed, but you can't rule by repression alone. And it looks like they're strong in the short run, but in the medium run and the long run, you will be defeated. Uh, and looking at, at a broader sense, you know, we all had great hopes for the Arab Spring in 2011. One government after another was falling, popular demonstrations <coughs> taking place, not, not just Egypt and Tunisia and Syria, but Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and all the countries in the region had some kind of demonstrations or We've also been disappointed by some of the results. There's now a new dictatorship back in power in Egypt. We've seen what's happened in Syria and so on. But there are some positive lights. What's happening in Tunisia is quite positive. They just recently had elections. The conservative Islamist party was defeated. The coalition of leftist and progressive and old regime figures won the plurality in the vote. More importantly than the vote, however, is the fact that trade unions and women's groups and student groups and professional societies are vibrant civil society functioning groups that lay the basis for genuine popular will running the country. Democracy is a lot more than just holding elections. If you've got opposition press and uh, NGOs and trade unions and so on functioning and carrying out work, that's a positive thing. And Tunisia is, is a good example of that. And so I think the, when history looks back on the Arab Spring, 
It's going to be not unlike what we saw in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist uh, revolutions of that time. In some cases, countries threw off the colonial yoke and installed a military dictatorship. In other cases, you had positive, thriving civil societies, progress for women, um, and, 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 and advances going forward. Some, so in other words, some things went well, some things didn't. But nobody today suggests that we have to go back to the era of colonialism. Nobody says, gosh, what the Congo needs is Belgium. <laughs> no, absurd. Nothing like that is in, in the Congress. And I think we'll look back on the Arab Spring in the same way, which is, yes, there were successes, yes, there were failures, but that old era of the religious and uh, political dictators is gone forever. Thank you all very much. I'll be very happy to take questions. Um, one is, with your optimism, uh, with the tyranny of the Islamic State basically beating itself in the long run, um, you know, clearly, um, Palestinians would certainly argue that their suppression by the Zionist entity, Israel, um, is similar, perhaps worse. And yet, the Israeli state has been in existence for over 60 years now. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on why you think that this particular brand of terrorism against certain groups in the Arab world is going to blow itself out, and yet Israel seems to be going strong, at least militarily, perhaps not in other ways. And the other thing I'm just curious about, uh, you mentioned Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and clearly you just spoke at Harvard, and Biden spoke at Harvard recently, and he acknowledged that the, um, that the funding and the support and the infrastructure that brought IS into existence was through the uh, through two of the United States' closest allies, Turkey, a NATO member, and Saudi Arabia. He basically said that, he kind of apologized, but I don't know that he ever discounted that. So I'm, my question to you on that is, do you have um, any um, opinion or evidence in terms of you know, the United States formation of Islamic State? Because the United States traditionally, whether it's Vietnam or all the way up to the present, claims it's just training people, it's, just doing this rather than anything else, and it would never obviously admit that. But do you have any evidence or any opinion on the United States' complicity or involvement with the formation of the Islamic State? And help create the conditions in which the Islamic State thrives. In 2003, prior to the US invasion of Iraq, there were no Islamic extremist groups in Iraq, despite all the claims out of Washington. They only arose after the US invasion and occupation, along with many other number of groups from other communities, religious ethnic groups. But one of the trends was a group called the Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it was called sometimes. And that group was uh, the predecessor to today's Islamic State. And there was a fight, uh, you may recall, the, the Anbar campaign, 2007-2008, surge when the US sent in all the troops it was an effort to defeat that group. And on the surface, it appeared to have succeeded and did indeed militarily defeat them, mainly because they had alienated the local Sunnis and so much. And I think that process was starting to see again. But they weren't completely wiped out politically. And they, in 2011, when the Syrian uprising began, they went over to Syria and started organizing there and getting some support. And that's where I think particularly support from overt support from, from Saudi Arabia and the fact that Turkey simply opened up its borders to all rebels going across, not distinguishing who was who, all contributed to the growth of it. I don't think the US, however, was directly involved in uh, instigating this on the or funding or anything like that. Uh, as for the other question, uh, virtually everybody in the Middle East knows that if you're going to have peace in the region, you can't look at each one of these uh, fights in isolation. In other words, the US wants us to believe that you've got Iraq and Syria and the Islamic State over here, 
and the Iran nuclear talks over here, and Israel and Palestinians over here. And in fact, they are interconnected. And if uh, the U.S. were able, for example, to pressure Israel to agree to a two-state solution where Palestinians and Israelis would live in peace side by side, that would do more to undermine the Islamic State than all the bombing put together. Yes. Because it would undermine them politically, which is what you have to do. You can't only defeat them militarily. They have to be, their sources of recruitment and popular support have to be dry up. And uh, anyway, that, that policy of the U.S. had enlightened leaders would actually make sense. I'm not expecting that to happen anytime soon. But it's certainly possible and would help lessen the impact of all of these terrorist groups in the region. Do you feel there's anything uh, the uh, progressive part of the American public can do to quote unquote intervene in the Palestinian debacle? Two things. I think the uh, people in the United States should support the peace movement in Israel among the Israeli Jews. Yeah. It's small, but it's there. There's some very dedicated people that I know that I've had and interviewed who are committed to a two-state solution. And I think people in the United States should support Palestinians who want the same thing, of which there are plenty of Palestinians. And there's lots of solidarity groups and nonviolent activity that's taking place to help that take, take place. Thank you. Questions. One was, um, I saw you speak when you were here a few years ago, and I, um, I recall correctly, in conversations with terrorists, you seemed to feel that the Assad regime was fairly stable. And other than, of course, the Arab Spring, um, I was wondering what had, what you thought had precipitated the change in the stability. And the other was, I had never heard that the deficit spending led to the 2008 financial crisis, so I wondered if you could say more about that. Sure. Yes, in my previous book, Conversations with the Terrorists, one of the people I interviewed was Pasha al-Assad, the president of Syria. Uh, and I uh, used some of that material in the current book, Inside Syria, as well. The, what I characterize Assad as a secular dictator, and so on the one hand, he did have a relatively stable regime, as it appeared as many of the regimes in the area appeared to be. But there were factors, and I did, I did mention in the book, and I elaborated on it this time. The economy was not doing well, the inflation was bad, the unemployment was very high, particularly among young people. Drought. Um, the drought, yes, exactly. The drought had lasted for several years and had driven farmers off their land in the cities, causing them more unemployment. And all of those factors contributed along with the political repression and the desire for an end to that political repression. Uh, and it turns out his regime that was not as stable as, uh, as previously thought, nor was Mubarak's, nor was Ben Ali's, or any of these other dictators. Um, as for the uh, economic situation, if you continually engage in deficit spending, you have to, the, the money's got to end up coming from somewhere. And military spending is particularly wasteful because if the government builds a bridge, you pay a company that hires workers, you buy steel, and then the bridge is used continually and it's helpful, needs repairs, it helps the economy in many ways, even beyond the original building of the bridge. And that's true for any civilian project. In the military, you buy the missile, you fire it, and it's gone. Right, it's wasted. There is no more continued economic benefit beyond whatever we might have paid the workers to make it in the first place and buy the materials. So the way the economic crisis was portrayed in the United States at the time, and still is, is that there were these people speculating in housing or maybe some of the evil bankers who were uh, engaged in uh, these uh, making bad loans and packaging up the loan into uh, bonds which then defaulted and that's what led to the crisis. Well, that was the immediate source of it. But the underlying economic problems had very much to do with the fact that the, um, uh, the U.S. was engaged in wasteful spending of a ma on a massive scale, something like $2 trillion now spent for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
and you can't do that and have a functioning economy. That's, we've gone beyond that. Two-state solution is no longer possible. And um, I wonder if you could mention to speak your your reasons why you think that's still a, an option. Yeah. Um, and I presume the alternative would uh, be the navigator be a one-state This is a one-state solution, and that would imply a different kind of democracy than currently exists in yeah. So you'd have a... Israeli Jews and the Palestinians living together in one democratic state where everybody has Well, to in the best of all possible worlds, that's a democracy is people having the same equal rights uh, in, in the country. But uh, a two state solution is implying that uh, there are really going to be two separate states. Um, and I wonder if that really is possible at this point. Okay, the reason I was asking is I, just, I want to make sure that. Your alternative. Um, look, if the Israelis and the Palestinians peaceably and through democratic means agree to live together in one state, that'd be wonderful. I have no problem with that. The problem is there's very few Israelis who are willing to do that. Uh, I uh, actually, as part of this book tour, I went and uh, met some Israelis who actually are advocates for one state. And they will be the first ones to admit that they have no popular support. So as a practical matter, if you're gonna, if, even if that is your ultimate goal, you have to go through something that's going to lower the tensions and the antagonism and the, uh, uh, that's, gone, that's gone for quite some time now. And they understand that you have to have a two-state solution as a step, even though they would advocate ultimately having a one-state solution. So that's one thing. As a practical matter, it's the only way that, that progress is going to be made. The other thing is that while in the United States, progressives talk about one state along the lines you're describing, and there's chunks of the uh, Palestinian uh, diaspora, particularly in Syria and in Lebanon, whose version of one state solution is all the Jews leave, and all the Palestinians who, uh, who are descendants of the original Palestinians from 48 come back. And I had some very interesting discussions with these folks, and I said, well, setting aside what happened in 48 and what was good and what was bad, there's at least three or four generations of Israelis that have now been born in Israel. What are you, are you going to kick them out too? And his argument was, they all have foreign passports. They all do. So again, let me, so, so calling for one state solution can mean very different things to very different people. And let me emphasize though, that view while common among some Palestinians in exile, is almost non-existent among Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Every poll, every political discussion that I've had with people shows that people in the actual area of Palestine want a two-state solution, and then they'll continue after that to whatever might be possible. So I'm curious about um, if you have any thoughts on the way that either of the strands of interventionism that you spoke about um, are at all wrapped up in race? Because it does seem to me that the US will intervene almost anywhere in the world at this point. In the last 20 years, we've intervened from Yugoslavia to Central African Republic to Iraq to Pakistan. Obviously, there's been a focus on the Middle East, but I'm wondering if you think that either of the two or both are actually wrapped up in race issues, or if that is somewhat incidental? Race certainly plays a role in U.S. foreign policy. And our attitudes towards people in rural countries is very different than our attitudes towards people in Europe or Canada or Australia. And you can't get around that. But the U.S. can also be an equal opportunity invader. And we saw that in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavs are Europeans, right? And in that war, the U.S. sided with the Muslims against the Orthodox Christian, if you want to put it in religious terms. The Muslims of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina were fighting against the Orthodox Christians of Serbia. So <coughs> you don't, you can't really understand the full uh, uh, capability of U.S. Uh, foreign policy. It was only seen through the 
the prism of either race or religion. It's about power, it's about economics, it's about military might. And that's consistent in US policy around the world. And it's made worse when those policies are carried out in Africa against the black majority, for example, in the era of apartheid when the United States supported the apartheid government in South Africa. We've supported plenty of uh, dictators in other countries as well. I might support um, eight groups or something, but it's just kind of horrible to just you know, keep reading about whether it's battle bonds or beheadings or things being done to women. Um, it's just kind of hard to be a guilty bystanders, as it were. Yeah, I think there's three things that I can speak to. One is build an anti war movement that opposes the current war, whether it's uh, the increased involvement of U.S. troops or the uh, increased arming of groups. And along with that, that means opposing everybody else's foreign intervention as well. I discussed that earlier. Two, support humanitarian efforts done on an international, multilateral scale. So the UN or other international aid groups uh, need help for the refugees who are living in Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon. There's lots of humanitarian work that can be done there. Anything from raising funds to going over there and helping out directly. And then the third would be people-to-people -people support. Uh, there are civil society groups still functioning in Syria. They're often working in rebel-controlled areas, doing like education, healthcare, and other kinds of work like that. And they need support politically, economically. Groups like the FSC is in touch with those folks. And it's, I don't want to overstate how much influence they have or how big they are, but they are there. They're doing good work and they need support. Great compliments, but yes. is there any solution? Or what are some of the possible outcomes given the, the uh, regional situation? The question I have a chapter in my book on. The history of the Kurds and the various Kurdish groups who are fighting in Syria and Iraq. The, uh, the Kurds have been messed over by continuous empires over the years and down to the present day. Uh, after World War I, the British and French had promised the Arab self determination. They had also promised that the Kurds could hold a referendum on independence uh, in the regions that they lived in. That was done both by Turkish nationalists and the uh, colonial powers. And so today, Kurds are split up among four countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Uh, and they face one or another form of discrimination and repression in all of those countries. There's very strong sentiment among Kurds for self-determination, for having their own state. Officially, the party, uh, the, the ruling parties in Iraqi Kurdistan call, of, are, I think, are planning to hold that referendum on independence. The majority, if not all of the parties in Syria and Turkey call for some kind of autonomy. They're not calling for independence from Turkey or independence from Syria. So what does that mean concretely today? Having the right to self-determination is different from exercising that right. And also, if you do become an independent nation, who's going to be running it and what kind of a country is it going to be? So, you know, there's exactly one country in the world that has currently come out in favor of Kurdish independence. Does anybody know what that is? <coughs> Israel. <coughs> Why? Because Israel has a history of trying to use non-Arab countries and peoples in the region to go after or attack or to undermine or divide the Arabs. They did that with Turkey when it was under military control. They did it with the Shah of Iran when he was a dictator in Iran. And they used the Persians and the Iranians against the Arab countries and so on. So they see the potential for being able to do that now in Iraq, with an independent Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and there's certainly factions within the US ruling elite that want to see an independent Kurdistan and that oil come to uh, benefit U.S. oil companies is one of the major motivating factors. 
if Kurdistan, I think the current policy of the US government is to oppose independence. And it's on geostrategic grounds, not out of any um, concern or lack of concern for the Kurdish people. If Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan becomes independent, the rest of Iraq is gonna fragment. Probably the southern part will become a Shia area and the middle part will become a Sunni area, sometimes called Sunnistan or Shia Stan or something like that. But it's very unstable as we know, that's where the Islamic State is in the middle of the country, in the Arab Iraqi part of the country. So he could, the Kurds try to portray it like, well, we'll simply draw the border, everybody will be happy with that, and um, we'll just then go on to be peaceable neighbors. But not everybody else is gonna be happy with where the border is drawn particularly since the Kurds have now taken Kirkuk and say it's ours. And some of the people living in Kirkuk, the Turkmen, the Christians, the Shia Muslims, and the Sunni Muslims are not real happy with the idea of being governed by Erbil. So in practical terms, there's a lot of um, conflict that was a result internally within Kurdistan, whatever its new borders are, and with its neighbors in Iraq. And of course, the Turks aren't real happy about having an independent Kurdistan as well. So um, I'm not making any predictions because this is a fight that's being, a battle that's being fought out as we speak as to what exactly the future of Kurdistan is going to be. One, one more and then we'll call it a night. What would be the problem of splitting Iraq, Iraq into uh, ethnic areas, religious areas, you know that uh, the United States is opposed to that. But well, the, the problem with it is what in, in the real world what would be the practical results? It's true that the borders were drawn artificially by the British and French. That's absolutely true. But there's all, they've also been there for 100 plus years, or almost 100 years now, and. <coughs> Potentially, you're going to have a lot of fighting and a lot of ethnic cleansing as each side drives out the population that it thinks don't agree with the new borders. Uh, that's one serious problem. And it could help make the instability in the middle of Iraq even worse. I think the United States is very concerned about that. And um, it's, it's a very volatile situation. So there are even some of the major um, Kurdish parties who, who oppose independence at this time. While they, they agree that independence is a long-term goal, they're also concerned about those issues of instability. So this, the, the second and third largest parties in Kurdistan are opposed to independence right now. 